Aloha and welcome to What's Bugging You, brought to you Hawaii's leader in pest control and the first company in Hawaii to earn the National Quality Pro Certification, Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Now here's the host of the show, Mike Buck, and today's guest and owner of the company, Michael Botha. Well, hello and welcome aboard, and and I'm so pleased to, to tell you that we've been looking forward to doing this program for such a long time. I've known Michael Botha from Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions for the whole time he's been in Hawaii, getting close to two decades now. We have a lot of mutual interest, and we've and he's been a very, very constant and and, and big supporter of, of my programs and what we do. It's not just because we relate, uh, you know, recreationally, and we'll tell you about that at another time. But it, it's I'm fascinated by what whatever somebody does to get to Hawaii and then become a part of the of the culture and be a, a, become a part of business and certainly uh you're going to learn a little bit about michael both and sandwich Isle pest solutions uh first of all uh you're going to notice that he speaks with sort of an interesting accent and everybody thinks gee you're, you're australian or, or a, a canadian or something but you're from south africa yeah uh, good morning mike good yes morning. Uh, from yeah. the deep south yeah uh they really couldn't get it any further away now obviously you know it's very 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 far away but I was amazed when we first met years ago, you told me how similar South Africa was to Hawaii. That's right. Uh, South Africa is literally 180 degrees around the world. Yeah. And so if you drove a hole yeah. through Hawaii, it would pop out in yeah, Durban, yeah, yeah. which is my hometown. Yeah. And, you know, when, when I was a kid, they used to say, well, if you dig a, b- a big deep hole, you end up in China. But in actual fact, you'd end up in South Africa. That, that's right. Yeah, it's exactly yeah, 180 yeah. degrees around, around the world, and it's the same distance below the equator mm. as Hawaii is north of the equator. Okay. So the seasons are the exact same except opposite. Yeah, so when it's that, winter yeah. here, it's summer there. Yeah. And that being said, um, how close are the weather? How close is the weather to ours? Weather is almost identical Isn't except that, that we don't have as many. We don't have. We have winds, but not trade winds. Mm-hmm. And um, so very consistent wind, but not trade winds. The sea temperature is exactly the same. So in other words, the humidity, the growing conditions, and more important, the pests are the same. The surf conditions, yeah, 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 the yeah, conditions, yeah, yeah. you know. But, but you know what, gang? Here, here's, here's the part that's really neat. Um, a lot of people fight being in the family business. Many of you know my story. I, I resisted as much as I could. I was always in radio and TV, but in, in a related family business. Michael is a third-generation pest eliminator. Uh, so, and I've met your dad, and 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 it, it was actually your grandfather that started in this business, and you never wanted to be. Yeah, and this is a very interesting story. The name of my father's company, uh, which he bought from my grandfather, was Hilo Fumigators. Hilo. Hilo. Yeah. It, it, completely unrelated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What does Hilo mean in, my, in, in, in uh, well, it, my my great my grandfather was an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. and he had bought a fishing boat. That was named the Hilo. Okay. And it was named after Hawaii. For, sorry, Hilo for Hawaii. Wow. And so when he sold that fishing boat, he took the money from that and started Hilo Fumigators, <laughs> <laughs> which is a space control company, which yeah. him and my dad ran for 40 years. Mm-hmm. So as a young kid, I grew up uh, doing pest control and tin fumigation with methyl bromide in those days. Which is interesting because today, uh, Michael's staff is, is wide and varied and departmentalized. But, uh, and I'm sure they know certainly after starting – this guy knows the whole deal because he's been there and done that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I have a son too, and he's been yeah. working in my business. At any any you know time from probably five years old, he's mm-hmm. been coming out with me on calls whenever I can mm-hmm. on weekends and learning the business, and he comes into meetings. And that's what I went through as a kid. Mm-hmm. We literally lived in the same premises yeah. as my dad's business. So I, every single day I'd do my homework in the office, and, and I'd be riding with the guys every weekend and, and every, every holiday. I, I think that I want to talk about the chemicals because I think I told you before, when I was a kid, Growing up on, here on Oahu, um, we used to ride around in, in Kahala on our bicycles with playing cards in the wheel sounding like a motor, and we used to follow the truck. And the truck used to have the mosquito, the, stuff. the mosquito stuff coming out the back of it. And we used to think that was really cool. Well, it's not, is it? I mean, you know, uh, we made it. Uh, there, It seems to me, and you can, and I'm sure, address this uh, during the time. When you first started using chemicals uh, or in your company, it's totally different than today. Yeah, and what yeah. you were talking about there was common. It's still commonly used in many parts of the world, including America in the south. Is that DDT? Is uh, that what it's that not is? DDT. It's pyrethrins today. Pyrethrin. Yeah, and so yeah. pyrethrins are a, a class of insecticide that are actually derived from the chrysanthemum flower, which comes from Africa, okay. from Kenya. <laughs> and, you uh, can run, but you can't. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, because it's difficult to come by, they have pyrethrin, which is the, mm. the manufactured 
um, molecule, mm-hmm. very similar to pyrethrin, and that's used for mosquito control. It's very, it's very good because it's, it's fast acting. It's a contact insecticide, but it has no residual. Okay, but let's go backwards now because I, I explained in the beginning, you kind of fought off being in the biz. You grew up in it. You had no choice. You had to go with dad and go on the, on the calls like your son is going on today. But uh, you didn't stay at, at Hilo. You didn't stay in, in South Africa. You left. You know, um, every every uh, young able-bodied male had to go and fight in the war mm-hmm. in, in uh, 19... Uh, it was 1982, we, I think. We called it the draft year. You called it conscription? Yeah, it was conscription. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were fighting a bush war. Mm-hmm. And so at the age of 17, I went in and, and I came out And uh, when I was 20. And uh, the only thing I knew was that I didn't want to be in pest control. Mm-hmm. I had no yeah, idea what I wanted to do. Convinced you didn't want to be in pest control. So yeah. uh, with my uh, $13.50 a month uh, pay from the army, I'd saved up $264. And, uh, a fortune, right? A I'm fortune. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was yeah. rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I left uh, with a backpack and a surfboard mm-hmm. and $264 and uh, traveled around the world for a few years mm-hmm. working in every type of job you can imagine um, before ending up in America. And which part of America? I ended up in America in Miami mm-hmm. um, on a sailboat. And uh, an interesting story, too. Uh, friends of ours who had smuggled their money out of the country because you couldn't leave South Africa and take your money with you. Mm-hmm. And they had actually filled the keel of their boat with gold. Wow. <laughs> and See, that's, that's like that's the how they got, days, right? The piracy <laughs> that's days. That's how they got their money out yeah. of the country. And yeah. I was on that boat and uh, ended up uh, arriving in Miami and, and at one point finally deciding that i needed to do something and i looked at what i could do and realized it wasn't much Mm -hmm. except for pest control and uh, decided that it was time to to be serious about life whether i liked it or not and uh, that that would be my career so Mm -hmm. i I went to broward community college in florida Mm -hmm. broward uh, county gang which is right near miami yep and uh, i studied uh, Mm -hmm. entomology Mm -hmm. and pest control technology and uh basically got just completely involved in in pest control and from a different angle at this point it was highly technical and there was so much to learn Mm -hmm. and it it, it seemed to be a career that i'd really be excited about you know when i when i first met michael years back uh we had um uh we we went to the university of hawaii and and did some stuff with uh with the with an epidemiologist there and learned how what a science this was. I mean, you know, a lot of us, uh, when we're kids here, Michael, think that, well, pest control is a, is a rubber slipper. Then you go, you know, you go find the cockroach in the kitchen, bang them with the slipper, and you've, you've done your pest control. Yeah. Uh, there are a certain level of this, which we'll talk about, but I still wanted the similarities in that geographically we're so similar to South Africa, so that all of the things that you did learn as a kid, and you put them back in this thing and locked them back in your, in your mind, when you got here, it started to make sense. But here isn't Miami. We're a lot, a lot different than Miami. So what, what got you to Hawaii? You know, um, the, the shortest question is the surf. Yeah, of course. good. good <laughs> I, I, yeah. I graduated. I was working mm-hmm. for a large company in California mm-hmm. in a training manager program. <clears throat> and uh, I resigned and was on my way back to South Africa to work with my dad. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, two days after I quit, my ex-boss called me up and said, listen, we just bought a company in Hawaii. Do you want to move to Hawaii? He said, you can surf as much as oh, you want. Oh, boy. <laughs> no, I how said, close okay, am well, I going to be to the surf? Yeah, how yeah, how yeah. good could that be? Yeah, I'm getting yeah, a paid yeah. trip to Hawaii for two years. I'll go work there two years and then go mm-hmm. home. And mm-hmm. and uh, came to Hawaii. And the, the minute I arrived, mm-hmm. I was at home. Yeah. This is this was a new instantly. This you is know, my home. It, it, you know, we hear that a lot. <laughs> but in, in, in your case and in many others, uh, it, and it may have done... Uh, going back to the emotions that you had as a kid growing up in South Africa. But when you get here and you find, wow. Get off the airplane. Yeah, 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 I mean, it yeah. was like one of those yeah. uh, Hawaii Five O type yeah. experiences. You know, you, I got off the airplane, felt that warm, humid trade wind air, mm-hmm. and I, I just immediately fell in love with it. Uh, yeah. Is the humidity the same in South Africa? Same. As it is? It's yeah. pretty much the same. Yeah. So that didn't scare you away. Uh, okay, so how how soon after that? Did you dry off from going surfing and get in the business? Uh, immediately, the same yeah, day I got yeah. you, I was at work, and yeah. I was working for a large national company mm-hmm. as their technical specialist for, for the Hawaii region. And I did that for three years and then realized, you know, Hawaii is going to be my home, and if I'm mm-hmm. going to stay here, it's not an inexpensive place to live. Sure, got to, got to and, strike uh, out. And sure. just like any other entrepreneur, I decided, well, um, I'll, start with, uh, I'll start right now. And I, mm-hmm. I had $10,000 that I'd saved up. 
and uh, spent six and a half thousand dollars on the truck. Parlayed the two grand he left South Africa with up to ten, <laughs> which was like a fivefold increase. I left with two sixty four, so yeah, now yeah, I was yeah, rich. Yeah, at that's that point. what I mean. Yeah, there you go, two hundred and sixty four. <laughs> but yeah. I actually spent sixty five hundred dollars on my first truck because I had no credit. I didn't yeah, have bad credit. Yeah, I just yeah. never ever had a yeah, credit yeah, card yeah. or never had been in debt. And uh, quickly learned that you have to have credit in America to succeed. One thing that I've known about your company <laughs> since, since we've known each other as long as we have is that you've grown into this thing uh, and, and you always anticipated things weren't always going to be terrific. That you could never get, you didn't want to get overextended where you'd have to, where you'd lose based on something happening to the economy. You've weathered some really tough economic conditions in, in, in business since you've been in business. You know, Mike, um, you're absolutely right. And one of the primary reasons that I chose pest control was because during the Civil War in South Africa, mm-hmm. many of my dad's friends who were very wealthy attorneys and doctors and lawyers and, you know, you name it, yeah. they went out of business mm-hmm. uh, for various different reasons. But his business, even though we didn't have the labor sometimes to do the work and he had to yeah. provide housing for the labor – um, at our facility because there were the riots mm-hmm. and strikes and things. Um, wow. We prevailed yeah. through the worst mm-hmm. of the Civil War. And what that made me think was that pest control is almost recession-proof if you do everything right. Okay, now, one of the things that you're going to learn during this program, the program, by the way, we haven't even told you the name of the program. We're, we're already, you know, 10 minutes into it. It's called What's Bugging You? And some something is bugging you. I don't care where you live or who you are. Something's going on there that shouldn't be going on there. And, you know, we can talk about how the backbone of the pest control industry internationally is termites because they just eat wood and, and, and we build with wood. But here in Hawaii, we have a, a wide myriad of things. Uh, still, is termites still the pretty much the backbone of most pest control businesses? You know, I, I think uh, if you look at our business, for example, mm-hmm. um, 35% of our business is termite. Okay. And so initially it was 100%. I was going to say, and so that's now, 35 now, 100 earlier. It's yeah. 35% of our business now. I would say that's probably average for a company in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Actually, on the mainland in the U.S., about 10% of revenues come from termite. Mm-hmm. About 90% come from general pests. So yep. other pests like rodents, ants, cockroaches, and that type of thing, and flies generate the, 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 the majority of the revenues today. As, as sure as one can be that the sun's going to come up probably and it's going to go down, the, the rest of it is there's going to be a pest in your life every day. And there, so you just got to figure out how, how bad do you want to get rid of them and what do you got to do to do it? Yeah, and you know, sometimes 100% eradication mm. is not necessary. Mm. Uh, everyone has a different threshold for pain. Or in yeah, this case, boy. pests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some people are happy to live with ants on the outside but not on the inside. Mm-hmm. Other people want not a single ant on the entire property. Other people are okay with 10 ants in the kitchen but, but, but no more than 20. But, you know, you know? I think that the, the, where, the, where you would draw the line of acceptance or not is when it comes to your, your family's health. And I do know that Michael and I, we, we've talked about this a lot, and we're going to skip around on this program. This is just sort of getting to know you on what's bugging you. But I, I can remember that uh, we've, we, we are in the middle of, or I guess maybe at the end of, or never ending, a huge problem with, with bed bugs. And it used to be a point in time when it was rare that anybody called Sandwich Isle and, and talked about bed bugs. And now it's a, a, a very regular occurrence. Uh, just too many of us, too much travel. What's the reason and, for these things? And Mike, that's a great observation. And that is a global phenomenon. Wow. So 10 years ago, if you had called our company and asked us for bed bugs, we would have said bed bugs. That's, a, that's like a – we don't have bed bugs in Hawaii. Yeah. And that's what it was. It was mm-hmm. so rare that we never even dealt with it. I don't mm-hmm. remember a single call. Today, we might have 15 to 20 calls per day yeah. on bed bugs. So globally, bed bugs are actually growing. Throughout the U.S., they're growing. The one thing to consider about bed bugs is it doesn't matter where they live. It doesn't matter if they're in Alaska or in Fiji, Mm -hmm. they will thrive just as easily because they don't live outside. They only live with humans. Yeah. They live, they're a human parasite. So So you can roll around in the grass and you're not going to get a bed bug on you. No. um, Typically, bed bugs are found where people rest. Mm -hmm. Um, So it might be a a chair, a waiting room, um, or a bed. Those are the more common areas. Now, gang, when you travel... And there have been, and Michael's company has been involved in it, and a lot of companies have been involved in it. There are top quality resort hotels, five star. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the economic level. It, it, it's it, it's to do with the opportunity. So if you go to a hotel on your next trip to the mainland, and Michael, you you said, it, it, you know, if it gets in your luggage, you bring it home with you. Well, in the sixties and seventies, bed bugs emerged. And they were completely wiped out with organochlorines, very, very effective um, 
type of insecticides mm-hmm. which were no longer made available recently because okay. they persist in the environment too long. Well, we completely eradicated the bed bugs. <clears throat> wow. There was one strain left. It was called the Harlan strain. And this is a strain that Dr. Harlan in Florida had kept. All research on bed bug insecticides was done based upon that one strain of bed bugs. So when mm-hmm. a chemical company was doing research on bed bugs, they would call them up and say, listen, you got any live bed yeah, bugs? Give me some bugs. Send yeah. them over. <clears throat> and they developed all the insecticides based on that. What happened with this new outbreak was we had bed bugs coming from a different part of the world that were re- repelled by mm-hmm. and were able to tolerate the types of insecticides would, that would kill the Harlan strain. So all mm. insecticides were labeled for one strain of insect. Golly, and then yeah. when these other ones started breeding with them, they found that we had these hybrid bed bugs that you couldn't control with pyrethrins because 97% of the pesticides available use pyrethrins for bed By bugs. By the way, these things are so tiny. They're just they're even hard to find. But I want to tell you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, blow Michael's horn for a minute because a couple of years ago, um, when bed bugs were starting to be a problem, uh, I heard that Michael had, had developed a, a a method of detecting and treating them, uh, involving a dog, a canine. And so, um, you know, I, I'm I'm very skeptical. Skeptical Sam, they call me. Uh, I invited Michael to come down uh, with his dog handler, and and show me. And they came into my studio, and put I think one or two bed bugs in this little box in the corner where I had a bunch of recyclable newspapers or something. Dog's not there. Dog's out in the lobby somewhere. Uh, and then bring in the handler, bring in the dog, and the dog sit there and behave in itself. And when given the cue, went to that thing like a heat-seeking missile, went right in the corner. And what in the heck is that all about? And you guys have that, and it's, I know it's, it's an important part of your diagnosis. How does that work? It's amazing. You know, canine sense detection has been around a long time. Mm-hmm. These these are the same type of techniques used to train dogs to find cadavers that are thrown yeah. into a lake and 50 feet underwater. Wow. And a dog can walk along the lake and find the body. Oh, um, it's the same yeah, It's yeah. the same type of training regimen. Mm-hmm. So they, they basically seek out um, dogs that have a very strong hunter instinct, mm-hmm. very highly motivated by food. That is a dog that just is super energetic, wants to go and, and mm-hmm. wants to get a reward for it. They take a dog like that and then imprint a scent on that dog so that that dog knows that when he alerts to that scent, he gets praise <clears throat> and he yeah. gets food. Yep. And, uh, Just dog, like us. You know, that, that's I right. get so, the same thing. Exactly. You yeah, tell yeah, us yeah. we got to I'm buying a burger right now. Yeah. Exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. Give us a steak to find termites. Yeah. We'll find termites yeah. everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? but, but, but I think what's incredible about this is that the, the – uh, I, I think the level in training must be including me intense. We are all now – it, we accept there's drug sniffing dogs. They they use them in 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 drug enforcement all the time, but a bed bug is so dinky. It must that the sense of smell of this dog must be incredible. Well, think about this: a, a adult bed bug is the size of an apple seed. Yeah, tiny little thing. A, a, yeah. There's five instars or life stages. So each mm. bed bug it starts at an egg, and mm. then each life stage gets a little bit bigger. It starts off smaller than a pinhead. Yeah, okay, geez. and gets to the size of an apple yeah, seed. Yeah. Apple seed at the sixth inch star, but the egg is the smallest of all. It's almost impossible to see with the naked eye. Mm-hmm. Well, these dogs know the difference between a live egg oh, and a dead egg. I'm, you're killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> so um, they can actually yeah. identify live eggs, and they won't alert on dead eggs. Um, these these animals obviously are very valuable. And, and, you know, and, and, and I would imagine not every one of them passes. I mean, you know, no. they, they probably have to, you know, get eliminated just like us trying to turn out for a football team. You know, you got to try out. That's right. I mean, they cost on average about $20,000 per dog. Wow. And then, yeah. you know, the, the maintenance on a dog is over $5,000 a month because you, mm-hmm. have to, every, you have to train them 24-7. They, they yeah. do not have a day off. So yeah. they have a day off in that they don't have to drive to work that day, mm-hmm. but they have to work to get fed every day. Is there any particular breed that's <laughs> uh, a more, uh, you know, you, you said it, it had to be a, a, a natural hunter. It's got to be a, hun- a hunting bird, a hunting dog. Pretty much any dog can do it. And, mm-hmm. and what it, I didn't think so either. I thought it would have to be like a hunting breed. But, yeah. but actually one of the most famous dogs of all time is a Chinese crested, which is yeah. it looks like a chihuahua with a, <laughs> with a mohawk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. that, that dog yeah. is uh, owned by, uh, I think it's Phil Kohler, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Phil Kohler in the University of Florida. And he did a bunch of research with that dog, and it's absolutely amazing. I've actually seen that dog in action. I've, I've seen the bond between your, your handler and the dogs. It's it's unbelievable, and I would imagine that that there that that's an, also an opportunity. We <laughs> talked about that. You came here and and decided to get in this business, but you know it, it went from you said 
uh, you know, termites were the majority of the business, and now it's it's about a third of the business. That means there's other things. Uh, some of them have been around a long time, but uh, I do know that, for instance, we go through here in, in Hawaii every now and again a rodent problem. And, you know, look at you, Michael. You're so busy with hotels and resorts and, and restaurants and everything else. That's a, it, it is a... Another big area of concern. Rodent, yeah. Rodents are one of the most important. And here's the thing about rodents. <clears throat> termites might, might cause damage. Mm. And, uh, you know, drywood termites over a long period of time can cause some significant structural damage. Mm-hmm. But think about what a rodent does when it chews on wires. Yeah. So Oops. when a rodent chews on wires, they can cause house fires. And they're one of the leading causes of house mm-hmm. fires in the U.S. And so I was recently traveling on the mainland. And I was meeting with a pest control operator in Montana. He had a house that had $73,000 damage done to a single pack rat that had gone into the electrical control system <laughs> for this home. Aye, aye, aye. So $73,000 uh, damage. Um, you said you talked about a hunting dog. I got to tell you, and you know about my connection with uh, with Nature Bee, the, the supplement. Yes. I had a, a secured Nature Bee stash at my house in a, in a storage uh, outside storage bin that your guys have since come and taken care of. It ate the, 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 the rodents will eat through wood, plastic, uh, any material to get it food. Somehow they can smell it in a container and they know that it's going to be a job, but they're going to get in there. They ate about a hundred bottles of nature bee. They're very, very healthy right now. Yeah. You know, but I mean, <laughs> but, so hard to kill. aren't you, aren't you constantly <laughs> amazed that they will go through? If you think those dog food containers that are, that, yeah. that are sealed or sealed, they're not. The rats go right in them. No, ro- and, and rodents are very persistent. If you, you, you know, you, every house on Oahu needs rodent control. If you do mm. not have rodent control, mm. it's just a matter of time before you have rodent damage. That's the, that's the bottom line. Yep. So rodents are one of the most significant threats to homes in terms of damage, more so yep. than termites in some cases. You need to go to sandwichisle.com. Uh, and that, that's the, the website for Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions, Sandwich Isle, I-S-L-E, dot com. And there is a banner line there where you can click on any number of problems and things that go in it. And you're going to find out really something really cool. And even though we're going to talk about the rodents and the termites and everything else, you go from a bed bug, which you can't even see, to a feral pig, which is huge. And this is the the... the scope and breadth of the service so i think that people still though michael need to know how the growth was you know i mean you you're famous because of your people you know every time i go out there i meet new exciting trained motivated um uh, people that that like coming to work for some reason you know know? mike uh, i appreciate you saying that because that's something we work really really hard to do so we wait 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 one more thing there's a guy uh, that is unfortunately for my house been promoted. He's been with a company, Michael's company, for a long time. He knew my house and my yard better than I did. He was out there for my Centricon termite treatment um, monthly to, to do the inspection, and he knew he he would tell me this is that or this is that. I mean, jeez, <laughs> it was like a friend, and that's kind of kind of what you did from the very beginning. You know, you, we we've been very fortunate. We still have some employees that are, have been with us since since we started. Sure, and so. You know, it took me two years to hire our first employee. Mm-hmm. I was so concerned about turning over one of the accounts that I had signed up <laughs> to someone else and yeah. have them mess it up. Yeah, I was yeah, like, there's yeah, no yeah. way. I'm going to just do yeah. it myself. And then yeah. finally I got to the point like any entrepreneur does where mm-hmm. you're like, I just can't do it all. Mm-hmm. And you, you actually start um, you know, not being able to service properly because you, you just got too much on your plate. Sure. And at that point, we started bringing in people. But, you know, the, the thing that we try to do is we, we have a culture in our business where we try to always do the right thing. And we try and seek out that same culture mm-hmm. in people who are applying with us. They, the, the culture of the employee and the employer mm-hmm. must align in order for them to be consistently in sync. And that's the key. So we like to hire hard is what we call it. Mm-hmm. So we'll take a long time to hire and fire fast. If someone yeah. doesn't do their job right and they, they – blatantly violating a company policy or you can see they're just not a fit yeah. we want to get rid of them as fast as possible yeah. and, you know thankfully that doesn't happen often but yeah we don't but like i to mean the amount of it. damage that somebody got oh, yeah. but here's another thing that, that I, I think is important if you go to sandwichisle.com like i'm suggesting not only are you going to find out uh the 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 width and breadth of, of of what they do but the knowledge that's there just so that you can research because what you've got michael is is a great interactive tool there where people can sort of uh, triage their own home by saying, "Gee, that's that's what I've got." And and from what I understand, it, it's actually encouraging 
uh, the DIY guys. There are plenty of guys that try to think, well, I got this little problem, I'll go take care of it. And they try something and it works, and they can do that. And then they get to a point where they say, okay, this is above my pay grade, I need an expert. You know, Mike, that's a great point because mm-hmm. our best customers – Mm-hmm. Are educated customers. Yeah, we want our customers to be as educated as possible because then they're going to choose us. Mm-hmm. Because uh, th- there's there's so much business out there, we don't have to not tell people how to do their own jobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, you sure. know, because yeah. everyone's going to need a professional at some point. Mm-hmm. So we like to share the information as much as possible and show people what they can do to protect their home. Because ultimately, we're trying to protect their homes from pests. Sure. And um, the more educated the consumer the better the fit for us because then they realize the value in the service we provide. Do some of the things, like recently we've had this big, uh, uh, this big about invasive species, particularly about this coconut uh, uh, rhino beetle. Uh, it's probably been around for a while, but uh, do they, does some pests become a favorite, be a buzzword? Oh, I think that's this. I got a cokey frog. I got to call sandwich aisle. Yeah, you know, I think the interesting thing about it is being in Hawaii, we're, we're very isolated, and when a new pest comes in, there are no natural predators. Yeah, big point. So yeah. It, it's very, very important that we react very quickly um, because if we have something, for example, more significant than the rhino beetle is, is probably like the imported fire ant. If we had those yeah. fire ants come here with no, no predators, they'll completely overrun Hawaii. They, they would, what, what, what are their predators? Well, in, in ants, it's normally termites and mm-hmm. other ants yeah. that, that are their predators. Um, and so, you know, in Hawaii, they would come out here and they will just overrun everything. Mm-hmm. And there'd be, there'd be no stopping them. And so um, when you hear these sensational stories in the news, it's because it is serious in Hawaii. Yeah. When you have an introduced species and an invasive species, you've got to put your foot down immediately. Well, one thing that happens is it, sometimes it's quality of life or, or you know, the, 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 health, the health of you and your kids in your home because of pests. But then there's other things like look at the amount of energy that we need to expend on this coffee borer beetle when we have, we're the only state in the, in the country that grows coffee commercially and is threatened by this animal, by this beetle. Yeah, and it can yeah. it can completely diminish the yeah. the um, productivity of a field. Mm-hmm. So you can get uh, I've heard as much as sixty percent or eighty percent a reduction in in, in in production from damaged crops from the coffee yeah. berry border beetle. So it's significant. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and as these things come up, I do know that it creates an awful lot of opportunity. And if we peel back the time a little bit further back to when you first got going. Um, I don't want to say that termites are a, are a great thing, uh, but, but it, it, I, I believe it's impossible to get rid of them. And I do know that a lot of people have a misunderstanding about this time of the year, for instance, is when they start swarming, right? In a human night. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought yeah. up swarming because that's one of the most common questions we have. Yeah. People call and say, I have, I've got these insects There are termites swarming. everywhere. Yeah. And a lot of people say there must be termites, mm. but ants swarm too. Ah. And uh, so ants swarm. Drywood, we have six different species, seven different species of termites now. Wow. Five of them are outdoors. They live in bushes and trees and, mm-hmm. and are very rarely a problem. And then you have two that are significant threats to, to homes, the drywood termite, the West Indian drywood termite, right. and then the Formosan subterranean termite. Now, here's an interesting thing. They both swarm sometimes on the same day. Oh, boy. And so at the double, same time. Double. yeah. And yeah. so you, you might have two different swarms at the exact same time at your house. And so, that, and that's not uncommon at all. And so, swar- swarming conditions typically are when there's no trade winds. Mm-hmm. There's high humidity, seventy percent plus. Um, the wind's less than two miles per hour. The sun has just gone down, and that's yeah. typically what happens. So, over a broad geographic area, all of the termites in that area will have their little scouts out waiting for the conditions. Mm-hmm. They'll report back to the colony, "Hey, it's good. Let's go, guys." And they they all yeah. take off. And the reason they're doing that is there are an equal amount of kings and queens. That all fly wow. out. Okay. And the reason they wow. all do it at the same yeah. time is to increase the probability of a king meeting a queen and being able to start a new colony. Mm-hmm. And so um, those are the primary reproductives. They, they meet and they start new colonies. I remember when I was a kid. I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, my, my father said, termites, <laughs> shut off the lights, shut the doors. Because, you know, the, you think that that's the last. If you, I remember being able to look up in a street light. And seen like literally a cloud yeah. there, and and this this is something that happens uh, more and more often. It doesn't seem is that we bring in are we bringing in more food for these guys? I mean, why aren't they all gone? With the amount of qualified people there are that fight them, why do we still have them? Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned those clouds because mm-hmm. if, if you've noticed, go back twenty years ago, those clouds were three or four months of the year you'd see those clouds under yep, yep. On, under, under the street right, in, in sure. summertime, but. Have you noticed that now? There's nope. really not that much of a problem anymore. So 
<clears throat> up until about a month ago, I think that ground termites have actually diminished somewhat. There's mm-hmm. definitely been smaller swarms and less of them. And uh, But interestingly, this year, we've seen a huge uptick, 7.5% increase in calls for subterranean termites. Okay. So is it possibly a large cyclic thing? Maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, but it's, it's interesting because I do know that you've explained the baiting systems and, and the Centricon that you guys were among the pioneers uh, for here uh, still seems to be, all this time later, a very good front wall so that you can find out and, and assess it. Uh, somebody that says, oh, I had my house tended and now I got Centricon. Uh, you, you, you told me something pretty interesting. Folks, you got to learn this. The minute you kill every termite, is th- that's great for one day. That's right. right. So when yeah. you tent your house, yeah. there's no for, residue left from the gas. Right. <clears throat> so the very same day that you take the tent off, mm-hmm. if termites are swarming, <laughs> yeah, they can swarm right back in your yeah. house again. So, but, we, but so then why tent? Because maybe <clears throat> there's there's ongoing damage that's taken a long time to accumulate, and if you don't stop it, you have to stop yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Because the accumulated damage of drywall too much is is yeah, very significant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, destroy your home completely. Mm-hmm. So you do have to you do have to tent, and in, in fact, the average house on Oahu tents about every seven or eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, so you definitely need to get it back to zero again and just understand yeah. that they're going to come back. But there are things that we do. For example, we we apply bore rates in the attics when, whenever we tend fumigate. Mm-hmm. So at least we know there's one area where there won't be termites. In the attic. Which is now, the most common area. What what besides termites <coughs> does tenting accomplish? Because I do know that, you know, a lot of people will tell tell you, and, and we've had calls mm-hmm. uh, on our Fix It Friday show before, which uh, San Rotel is also. And, and I, look at just a quick reminder to go to sandwichisle.com, sandwichisle, I-S-L-E dot com, and see some of the things that we're talking about. But I do know that there's a, a an additional benefit of tenting because there's certain other uh, pests that get eliminated by the, by the chemical in the tenting. Well, here's the thing, Mike. Um, the label for Vicane gas, which is the primary gas used mm-hmm. to fumigate structures for drywood termites, has a label that has a few other pests on it. Okay. Rodents are on the label. Mm-hmm. Bed bugs on the label. Good. Various types of beetles, including powder post beetles and carpet beetles, are on the label. Um, all the different, well, drywood termites on the label and Formosan ground termites are on the label, but you have to use four times the amount of gas. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And for example, powder post beetles, you've got to use 10 times the amount of gas. Um, bed bugs, one and a half times the amount of gas. So there's only a few but mm-hmm. uh, that are on the label, but the ones that do not appear on the label are geckos okay. and ants. And spiders. And they just make it right through. And there's a reason yeah. for that. There's no hymenopterous insects on the label. Uh, hymenopterous insects are like bees, wasps, and ants. Okay. And there's a reason for that because it's not proven to be very effective on them. And that's why they're not on the label. So you, you said you do have some additional benefits. The greatest benefit is usually centipedes and roaches will die. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes customers say, man, there were a whole bunch of dead, in, uh, dead uh, insects and dead lizards, but I did see some live lizards. <laughs> or geckos. You got to come back. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. geckos yeah, yeah. that are around and ants that are around are actually coming in to eat the dead insects. Wow! So yeah, after fumigation, yeah. after fumigation, ants will actually come in and take over those galleries that the drywood termites lived in and eat all the dead bodies. And so, and and geckos will do the same thing. What about this, though? I mean, you know, I I, I know from firsthand experience in in certain things. As you know, my wife's a realtor, and every transaction requires you know, tenting or whatever. Uh, and these things are, are just uh, wonderful to see. But would, would sometimes leaving, if you need to use more of the chemical, do you just leave the tent on longer? Does it do the same job in the same period of time? When is it safe to go back into a home? <clears throat> so tenting is an interesting thing. Um, when you tent fumigate a house, you have a ver- variety of factors that can be adjusted. Mm-hmm. You can increase the dosage, meaning that you could use more gas, and then reduce the time. Or you could increase the time mm-hmm. and decrease the dosage. So there's a variety of factors you can adjust. There's a calculator that's used every time you shoot gas. Yeah. That and, and, and so typically a house is shot for 20 hours, 20 to 24 hours. That means that um, the fumigation company will arrive. You'll be out of your house for that 20 or 24 hours during which time it's tented. Mm-hmm. Then the house gets untented. And for a period of at least six hours, the clock starts when the tent comes off. Um, that house has to be has to remain vacated, mm-hmm. and then at the end of the sixth hour, the fumigator comes back in again with a, a gas analyzing instrument 
to make yeah. sure that the gas is less than one part per million or whatever it might be for that particular gas. Gotcha. And uh, then it's safe for reentry. Yeah, this is why there are certain things that it should be above your pay grade. Like if you if you think that you shouldn't be up on your uh, on your roof cleaning your rain gutters, you're probably right. Uh, you know, because you can fall down and get hurt. But there's also, I, I do know that the industry is pretty self-policing. You guys are really tough on on making sure that, uh, you know, these things are complied with. But we, we do have to remind people that it is a poison, that you got to be very careful around this stuff. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it definitely. I mean, um, fumigants are very hazardous, mm-hmm. and that they should only be used by a certified applicator. And when you talking about policing the hawaii department of agriculture does a pretty good job mm-hmm. and they come out and uh, they've inspected me probably once a year mm-hmm. they'll come in they'll say mike i want to see you at a job and and let's uh, inspect your paperwork and, and observe yeah. the entire operation and so that's that's a really good thing and as a as a customer you want to work with a reputable company absolutely and yeah. a licensed company mm-hmm. don't ever work with someone who's unlicensed mm-hmm. who's not been regulated what does the license cover I mean, you know, you, obviously your company is licensed, but I mean, that means that your employees are, are, are under the license. And I, I talked about, uh, how careful everybody is at Sandwich Island. We've talked about this many, many times. Is people go through a screening process to become an employee there, you gotta be right on it. And, and that, that must mean that there's a big learning curve. Yeah. You know, we, what we do is we have five help wanted ads running. Mm-hmm. All the time, yeah. And the reason for that is, be- well, one is because we're growing, but the other thing is, it takes us so long to hire someone because not everyone who applies is qualified. Sure. <clears throat> so um, the qualification process typically starts like this: you fill in an application, and you take an integrity test. The integrity mm-hmm. test basically tests your ability to make decisions on things being right or wrong. Mm-hmm. This is something you either have or you don't have. That's the first step. We want to first yeah. see, are they, do they have the integrity that's level that we, that's in alignment yeah, with our yeah, company? Yeah, yeah. And then there is a safety quotient, which basically sees if they're a safe person. Are they, you're talking about ladders? Yeah. 324,000 people die from falling off ladders every year. Yikes. Co- correlate that to only 30 people getting yeah. killed by bears every year. Yeah, and that, <laughs> you know that's why I mean? I'm never going, uh, I'm, <laughs> roofs are off my bucket list. I'm not interested yeah. in a roof anymore. And, yeah. and, and so yeah. safety quotient is super mm-hmm. important because mm-hmm. you get a person who, like me when I was younger, and which is why I'm missing a finger and I've got yeah, a whole yeah. bunch of other injuries, <laughs> I didn't need to yeah. be so concerned about safety. You can, yeah. People like that are not, not safe to have mm-hmm. around you because they might injure you. No cowboys here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then there's a whole level of, of, of mm-hmm. testing. And, and once you get through that, then the, the training starts and you have to become a certified applicator. And so in Hawaii, you have multiple That's what different I was categories. At. That I was going to yeah. say, what, what happens is each one of them is another badge that, that an employee becomes more and more valuable as they become certified right. in more and more facets. So there's multiple different categories. Mm-hmm. You have pest control, termite control, um, you know, um, mm-hmm. tent fumigation. And, and so basically everyone has to get certified in each category. And then once you're certified at that category, then, you, then you're good to go. And mm-hmm. you've, you've basically got your certification to back up every application you do. We were talking uh, a while back. If you're just joining us, uh, this program is called What's Bugging You? And the reason why, I actually, I'm the name maker up, right? I, I submitted my suggestion to Michael, and he went for it, because that's exactly what they do. Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions uh, is uh, it's actually uh, Michael is third generation in the pest in the pest uh, control business and and uh, and nobody knows as much as he knows and yet you're a sponge for knowledge you, you keep learning and you keep learning new things one of the things we talked about before and I know it's a small part of your business but it's it, it's not small to me if I've got the problem and that is we talked about little tiny bed bugs let's talk for a minute about one of the things that you've done more recently uh and that is huge big feral pigs and 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 chickens and dogs and and things that just don't belong how how important that a service that can be yeah so specifically with the dogs i mean what we try to do is we we will have perhaps a a feral dog um, on an agricultural area. We only do it in agricultural areas, mm-hmm. the dogs. And what we'll do is we'll trap that dog, try and find out if it has a home. If not, then take it to the Humane Society. Um, that's more of a, a, a case-by-case type thing mm-hmm. where it's a dangerous animal. But there's no one else that's doing that privately. Um, we do a lot of bird, chicken, yeah. uh, trapping. So chickens are a complete nuisance in some way. Yeah, real by, landscape by the way, problem. I'm glad you brought that up because I saw an article that bothered <laughs> me the other day in Huffington Post about Kauai and and it meant it made people think like the island is totally overrun and dangerous chickens are everywhere 
Uh, if going on check, this could be a problem. I don't know how severe it is on Kauai, but you here on Oahu that you guys get into that. Uh, people don't realize what a problem they are. Why Why are feral chickens a problem? Here's, here's one of the primary reasons. They, they are really noisy. Mm-hmm. So roosters, these red jungle fowl, they don't know the difference between yeah. <laughs> 12 o'clock at night and, yeah. and 6 a.m. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, their alarm just, clock's all messed yeah, up. They, yeah. they go throughout the night. Mm-hmm. And so um, they can be a real nuisance from that respect. Mm-hmm. And then digging. When they're digging for centipedes and worms and cockroaches and things yeah. around plots, they can seriously undermine trees. And so we've had people with Golly. panic panic hedges, mm-hmm. with entire hedges being undermined because because of chickens digging around the root yeah. base. And uh, and then they they if they get into a flower garden, they'll destroy that too. But and they destroy lawns with it, with their digging. And so um, we have a lot of cause for chickens. And so you know chickens are fairly easy to trap. And uh, we're we're actually a distributor for the company that makes the traps. So we yeah. we sell the traps as well as we do the work. So uh, chicken removal is a very big part of our business today. Um, so is yeah. pigeon removal. Uh, so, yeah, and you know, and the pigeons, by the way, uh, are uh, they pose a health issue? Yeah. I, I you know I, I guess that maybe in some respect chickens might, but I don't know if that that, that even pales in comparison to uh, how dangerous some of the other things might be to your health. There's a lot of health issues related to pigeons, you know, primarily their feces mm-hmm. and then their feeding habits. So um, you'll, you'll be sitting at a, a beachfront restaurant, for example, and you'll turn to go back to the buffet and you'll yeah. come back and there's a pigeon sitting on your plate, yeah. taking a dump on the, on the yeah, table right on the and table. pecking at oh, your food. Yeah. And so yeah. that's disgusting. Yeah. And so that, that, that is a big problem. And then they, you know, they're often with a roost and loaf, they'll sit above a car and or a piece of machinery mm-hmm. or equipment. And, and uh, guess what happens to that, the finish of that thing, right? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, acidic, yeah, and so it yeah, causes damage. Yeah. Or it, very often they're in air conditioners. Mm-hmm. They'll sit on an air conditioner or under an air conditioner, and then all of the air going into the building is goes gets filtered through <laughs> it, a bird nest. I was going to say, <laughs> it's gone through the south end of a north sitting <laughs> bird, you know, so it gets yeah. gets to be good. But, but, and, and I do know that you always hear that, you know, uh, the, the the bane of the housewife has got to be the, 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 the cockroach, right? When you yeah. turn the light on in the kitchen at night, go get a drink of water, and you see one of those 747s on the floor, people oh, yeah. think, I don't have cockroaches. Well, we all have cockroaches. It's yep. just where are they, right? You know, um, I occasionally have to deal with the same thing. Yeah. So, you know, I have kids. The old slipper. We He's live a, in Hawaii. The, the, the doors king, are open. Michael Both is the king of pest control, <laughs> and he has a slipper in his kitchen just in case, right? <laughs> well, the thing is, we have we live up on the North Shore. Yeah, yeah. We have our windows open all the time. Sure. we got kids that leave the screens open for yeah. days and then before we figure out they're even open. And so what happens is American cockroaches, which is the giant big one you're talking right, about, right. are extremely strong flyers. Yeah. And so what happens is they'll just fly in. Yep. And or they'll fly onto a screen and then crawl underneath it and come inside. Mm-hmm. And so um, everyone goes through that. The key thing is to have a regular pest control service so that you have material in the areas where cockroaches are going to go mm-hmm. so that when they come in, they encounter that material or bait and they die. Because if you don't have that, mm-hmm. what's going to happen is they're going to breed and you get overrun with them. And that's the problem. I'm the, kind of in- amazed. Uh, one of our other shows that we do is with Atlas Construction. And when they're doing an addition or a second story, uh, somebody says that they, I don't have roaches. And inside the walls of our homes, these double wall homes, there are maybe tens of thousands of roach in every house. Well, not in every house. I mean, none of the ones at Sandwich Owl Services. But yeah, no, <laughs> that, that's but, what uh, I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting yeah, at, sandwichowl.com. The, yeah. the, the point is, is that if you yeah, don't do something yeah. about it, it doesn't matter who you are, yeah, you're going to yeah. have roaches. Yeah. It doesn't matter how clean your house is. That's say, got nothing yeah, to do yeah, with yeah. it. It's not yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, don't you dare leave a piece of bread in the kitchen because you're going to bring in the roaches. But they are there to eat. The, they are there, yeah. and, and but they can find food anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you have a perfectly clean house and you leave a window open you'll have roaches that come inside and they'll yeah. find something to eat yep. and and so you you have to make sure your screens are ready good you got to mm. you know try and make sure your doors have thresholds on the bottom that the doors yeah. and windows are always closed uh, if they don't have screens and um but you are, are going to have to deal with that in hawaii you are going to have roaches that fly in what is it with them particularly at night i mean you know if you have a light on and you have door open i, I like i let my dogs out Every now and again, this thing just <laughs> comes flying into the house, and it, it, it seems like it takes forever. I, I know that there is a panic approach and that there is a sensible approach. And from what I understand, one of the things that you guys specialize in is when somebody calls you with a problem, you're going to go as part of your triage of their house. You're going to say, all right, 
I'm glad you called about this. My guy also noticed this. Let's talk about let's talk about management. What's the plan on somebody that's got a freestanding single hall, you know, single family home? Uh, they 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 must have some termites that they don't know about. They probably got some roaches. They probably got some rodents. Uh, what what what's step number one? You know, I think the key is inspection. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> every every house is unique. And just to go back to that scenario you just spoke about, using a vacuum cleaner with an extension rod is actually a really good way to remove that one cockroach that flew in that mm-hmm. you were just talking about. If you've got a, a powerful vacuum cleaner, keep it with a long rod on it. That's what I do. Yeah. And if a, if a cockroach flies in, go right up to it and just suck it up real quick because <laughs> uh, that's that's probably one of the best yeah, ways yeah. to get rid of it. Um, but yeah, That or a flamethrower. I mean, you yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, the key is inspection. Every house is different. Every mm-hmm. situation is different. So what I would suggest doing is that you have an, an expert come out and inspect the premises to try and see if there are any conditions that are conducive to pests. Mm-hmm. Are there reasons why the pests are there? For example, is there a mulch pile nearby the house mm-hmm. that might be infested with centipedes and which are feeding on those little Pacific beetle roaches? Yeah. So if you remo- just by removing that mulch pile, you might solve your roach and yeah. centipede problem. You know, I've noticed other things from Michael over the years as well. I'm going to spend one minute, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, on on mosquitoes because mosquitoes are uh, very very unhealthy for a number of reasons uh but it is kind of predictable i mean if somebody's having a mosquito problem y- you guys can go out there and find out what it is right away what what causes a mosquito problem yeah the key thing with mosquitoes is you, you and the key way to control them is to control the source mm-hmm. so mosquitoes are there because they're breeding somewhere so mosquitoes need water to breed <clears throat> they lay their eggs in the water and the larva goes down and forms little spinners mm-hmm. and then they emerge as adults so wherever there's mosquitoes nearby, there's a breeding source, and you need to remove that breeding source. Yep. It could be something simple as a bird bath that's been left unattended and, and not cleaned out. Mm-hmm. It could be an old tire line behind a... Oh, that's a famous one, isn't it? Yeah, they, they, they love that. Keep those four tires <laughs> right behind the garage full of water. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Or a potted plant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You might be watering it every day, and the little catch tray at the bottom has just enough water every day for them to lay their eggs in and, and to breed in. And so the key thing is standing water. Yeah. And, uh, and marshy areas. Mm-hmm. Once those are corrected, and it might be a gutter. A block gutter is another real common common area. Where I, I've got a dear friend. He's, <laughs> he's also, we do a lot of work with Kevin Mulker and Mulker and Landscaping. And one of the most popular plants these days are mosquito homes called bromeliads. Oh, and especially terrible. these big old bromeliads. Uh, and, and Kevin says, okay, it's true. They're a nightmare. But if you regularly empty the water out of them and refill them, it's okay. If you just leave them sit for a time, uh, and, and that's the key is to ask the, sci- the expert in, in you, is how long does that water have to sit bec- before it becomes a mosquito home? Different species of mosquitoes breed uh-huh. at different rates, but we have probably five, five days before, okay. two, before they emerge. That but means th- that we have different species here? <clears throat> we have different well, species here. So <laughs> the, the thing about bromeliads is I had bromeliads, <clears throat> and I removed every one of them. Is I must have right? had three or 400 of them in my, my yard when, I, when we bought oh, our no, house. Sure, sure. I treated them. I threw granules on them. I did everything I possibly could. I could not stop the mosquito problem mm-hmm. over there because it's just there's so many bromeliads. There's always one or two that don't get the insecticide in them. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, in the end, I, I, it was such a hassle to move them. I just told anyone in the neighborhood, if you guys want them, you've got to come and take them out. Yeah. And uh, we got rid of all of them in one weekend. <laughs> no, so I don't, I don't recommend them. In other words, signed, sealed, and done. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate because they, they can be quite pretty. Yeah. Uh, but, you, but, you know, that's why I asked the question because sometimes a, a walkthrough is all it takes to determine that. But from I, I learned... Uh, from you and from the university years ago, that mosquitoes in their life don't travel very far from where they're born. No, they don't travel very far. They're more affected by wind patterns. Mm -hmm. So if it's a real strong windy night, they might not be able to fly where they want to go. They might have to just fly with the wind. Very often what mosquitoes do is they'll learn that um, there's a host nearby Mm -hmm. because mosquitoes um, need to have a blood meal Mm -hmm. in order to to breed. And so what they'll do is they'll set up in, in staging areas. So, for example, let's say you go outside and you, you watch the sun go down on your lanai every night. Oh, boy. There might be some nice uh, ornamental plants nearby. Mm-hmm. They'll fly and they'll stage on those plants waiting for you to come out. As soon as you come out, they'll fly over and they'll start sucking your blood. <laughs> and then they're so bloated and heavy yeah. with blood, they can't fly very far because yeah. they, they, they're overloaded. Mm-hmm. So they'll fly to the closest you know, staging area sit down and they'll have to just keep still to digest the blood for a while before My they goodness. can fly off. That's why a 
perimeter pest control spray in those areas mm-hmm. is perfect. So you're not actually spraying the people or spraying the veranda. You're spraying the ornamental plants where they're staging. And, and so that's yeah. how mosquito programs work, as well yeah. as attacking the source by using things, um, often um, enzymes, to, to attack the actual you know, source. Th- th- there's another thing. As you've pointed out, you learned this on the North Shore in your house, and we all love the outdoors. We love to barbecue. We love to entertain. And when there's flies, uh, it's a huge problem. And I do know that you've got uh, you know opinions about that. Are the zappers any good? Uh, what, what causes a home to have a fly issue? Yeah, so flies are usually a sanitation problem. Mm-hmm. And in fact, flies and mosquitoes are both in the order diptera, which means two wings. And uh, so they're very similar. Um, but in the case of mosquitoes, it's water. In the case of flies, it's sanitation. They need decaying organic material in order to ah, breed. Okay. And so you have to make sure that you don't have any decaying organic material. And very often what that is is it's inside a trash can or a dumpster mm-hmm. where all that stuff builds up on the bottom. No one sure. wants to touch it. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it stinks. Well, that's where they – That's where, everything else might be clean, but that's where they're breeding. We love our dogs, and, and I make a habit of scooping up. Because from what I understand, that's another real problem area. And even the container in which you dump the droppings in, is you better have that. That better seal pretty well. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a two English yeah. Mastiff, so I know exactly yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. We yeah. have a uh, you know, quarter of a bucket a day almost. Yeah, yeah. And well, uh, you well, have to what, seal it up tight. We don't have quite that much, but we do have two golden retrievers, and they're, they're just canine you know, pooping machines. You yeah. know, they just they eat, they poop, they eat, they poop. <laughs> uh, but, but I think that what needs to be, so that we can embrace everything that Sandwich Isle does, I want everybody to go to sandwichisle.com, okay? S-A-N-D-W-I-C-H-I-L-I-S-L-E I-S-L-E, dot com, because you will find there invaluable information which will help make you decide what can I do myself and where do I need to call the experts. Yeah, and I think a lot of pest control mm-hmm. can be done by the homeowner. Sure. Um, there's so many things and tips that we have on, on how to keep pests out of your house. And mm-hmm. that's really our goal. Keep the pests out of your house mm-hmm. so you don't have a problem. And then when you do have a problem, call us and we'll take care of the difficult problems. I know, Michael, that one of the big issues in your industry is chemicals. Uh, and that the, the proper use and the proper dosages are, are what's key. Talk about how that is also very important when you decide to do something yourself or not with regards to what people may or may not know about the chemicals they're <clears throat> using. Some of the worst offenders of pesticide misuse are homeowners. Mm-hmm. And uh, sadly, there's a lot of poisonings in, the, in homes, yeah. normally kids. So I always reckon I don't have any I don't have any chemicals in my house. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I apply chemicals in my house to control pests, but I don't mm-hmm. keep anything in the house. And you know I have kids, and you you sometimes sure. just can't keep your eye on everything. And so um, I always recommend to people if you're going to have to do a pesticide application, let an expert do it. There mm-hmm. are things you can buy over the counter, but then where are you going to store that, and uh, who's going to have access to it. Um, and, and are you actually going to follow the safety requirements? Are you going to be wearing gloves and a respirator? I was going to say, how, how key is all of that <clears throat> stuff? You know? Very yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, Michael, there's another thing, too. I know that right now this is people hearing this for the first time are going to go to sandwichisle.com and check it out. I, I think that maybe a, a couple of words of encouragement might be that, that never give up. That, that There's always a way, when they call you guys up, you're going to find out a way to deal with their condition and, it's, and, then, and maybe – figure out some sort of a maintenance program to prevent something from returning. I think the the good news that needs to be told mm. is that there's not a pest control issue that cannot be solved. Mm. There's not a bed bug problem, a feral yeah. pig problem, a chicken problem, bird problem, roach problem, yeah. ant problem, you name it, that cannot be solved. Yeah. And so the good news is if you have a problem, you can solve it. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes we deal with people that are, uh, I mean, just completely falling apart because of a type of a pest problem. It might be bear yeah. bugs, it might yeah. be roaches, it, it could be termites destroying the home that they built. And they, they just feel like there's no end yeah. to the pain. Yeah. Well, there is an end to the pain. Yeah. The, the, you don't have to live with that. You can easily solve that problem. Now, one of the ways you can get your, your feet wet here, excuse the expression, is to get onto sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. One of the things that happens is, I, I do know that most people don't call an expert until they've got an issue. You know, and that's what happens in your business. Something comes up like a swarm <laughs> in Kailua tomorrow. Boom, 55 people call and they want you out yesterday. You know, the, yeah. the, the experience that I have that, that, is the, that is the most alarming for me is bed bugs, mm-hmm. which are human parasites. They yep. suck our blood. That's how they yeah. live. They, they're disgusting, right? And people that get bed bugs s- sometimes have severe reactions to them. You can't be in denial about it, right? I know a lot of people get embarrassed about this. So here's what I see with bed bugs. 
the worst cases we see, and I'm talking 10,000 bed bugs in a single bed. My goodness. Where people have bed bugs living in their ears and in every part of their yeah. body. The worst cases are people that have left it because they thought they could control it themselves. So when you get to something like that, uh, d- don't feel like you have to keep beating your head against the wall because yeah. sometimes you're not going to solve the problem. So the worst problems I've ever seen have been problems like that where people have thought they could do it on their own and they were just determined to make, make it work and it didn't work. Hey, you're going to find out how things do work when we come back and give you more of these shows. Uh, Michael Botha, thank you very much for being with us today. And we invite you to come back again next time for What's Bugging You, brought to you by Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Go to sandwichisle.com. Sandwichisle.com. Have a good one. Aloha. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And in the meantime, jump online and find more at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. 